Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess, Planetarium Manager at Union Station, and thanks for joining us tonight uh, for our 96th live stream. Uh, and tonight's going to be a special presentation all about comets. We are going to be creating a comet in my kitchen. Uh, I'll give you a little sneak peek of what that's going to look like here. Uh, so uh, be excited for that. But uh, for now, we're going to start with some introductions. So welcome to everyone who is tuning in tonight. Uh, hopefully you're having a good evening and a wonderful Friday. Like I said, this is our 96th live stream. We've been doing these shows for the past three plus years. Uh, and if you're a first time watcher, go be sure to check out all of our recordings for our past shows over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. We have over 80 hours of content and 95 streams to check out. Uh, and, but we are nearing the end of our live streams that started all the way back in 2020. We are going to be ending uh, at stream number 100. Uh, and this 96th live stream, we're bringing back one of our uh, most exciting streams from a few years ago where we're going to be creating a comet. So we're going to be actually creating a real comet with ingredients that you can get at a grocery store. Um, so you'll definitely not want to miss that and check that out. We do have other, uh, a few other special presentations planned for the rest of this year and early next year, leading up to our 100th live stream. Uh, next month in October, we're going to be doing uh, a deep dive into some more science fiction astronomy. We'll be looking at some movies and TV shows that we didn't cover uh, in our uh, past shows on that topic. So you'll not want to miss that. That'll be sometime in October. We'll announce the date for that. Uh, and then uh, our 98th stream will be sometime in late November and early December. Uh, we will be talking about some celestial navigation and other uh, sort of ocean slash beach related astronomy. We've got some special surprises in store for that. Uh, and then uh, hopefully sometime next year for our 99th live stream, we'll be doing an in-person show uh, at the planetarium. Um, and so stay tuned for details about that. And then hopefully our 100th show will be on our fourth anniversary at the end of March. We're currently sitting at 345,000 views for these streams, so we're hoping to break 350,000. So if you're watching, uh, let us know uh, in the comments because we love seeing everybody uh, tuning in. And if you have any questions throughout tonight's show, be sure to po put those in there as well. We've got Tammy, one of our uh, top fans watching from Iowa. Thanks for watching tonight, Tammy. And Jerry, another one of our top fans who is bummed that we are reaching the end of our regularly scheduled live streams. Uh, but don't worry, Jerry, hopefully we'll be going out with a bang. A couple little housekeeping notes. The planetarium is closed right now for our annual maintenance and training. Happens every September. Uh, we're closed this week and next week, but we'll be reopening uh, on Saturday, September 16th with a Tuesday through Sunday schedule. Uh, and a very quick announcement. We do have tickets available now for evening laser shows. Um, we've got a Great slate of shows available uh, this fall. The next one will be on September 23rd, which is going to be a Beatles night with Laser Beatles and Sgt. Pepper's Laser Light Show in celebration of Ringo Starr's concert in Kansas City. Other shows include Beyonce, um, Laser Stranger Things, Aerosmith, some more Pink Floyd, and we're bringing Taylor Swift back for her birthday on December 13th. So be sure to check those out. All right, once again, this is a live stream. If you're watching on Friday, September 8th, uh, 2023 at 6 p.m., be sure to let us know in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, and uh, hopefully um, this will be a fun show. Uh, and if you happen to be watching a recording of this, you can post a question in the comments as well, and I'll try to get back and answer those at a later date. But let's jump into tonight's show all about... Uh, um, it's, uh, Jerry is saying that we have a great Christmas show. Highly recommend. Jerry's probably talking about our Stars of Faith show. That's our uh, live planetarium show all about uh, the night sky and specifically relating to the holiday season where we talk about how astronomy connects to different faiths throughout the world. Um, so be sure to check that out. We've got Leanne tuning in. Great to see you, Leanne. Thanks for watching tonight. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show and hope you're doing well. Uh, and uh, be sure to let me know if you have any questions about the comets tonight. So we're going to jump in right uh, away to all about comets. And we're going to start sort of broadly discussing what a comet is. We'll talk about what they're made of later on when we're making a comet. Uh, but to start out, basically comets are cosmic snowballs made of frozen gases, rock, and dust. Um, they have highly elliptical orbits, very oval-shaped, which means they tend to stay far away from the sun most of the time. And there are different types of comets. 
Um, a comet's period is the length of time that it takes to orbit the sun one full time. So there are two major types of comets. There are short period comets that uh, orbit the sun very, fairly uh, relatively quickly. So a short period comet would come back around the sun every 200 years or less. Uh, they originate from an area in our solar system called the Kuiper Belt, um, which is a band of uh, dusty and icy debris sort of outside of the major planetary orbit. So you can see a diagram here uh, of the general layout of the solar system where we have the planets uh, at this center, of course, uh, and then the Kuiper Belt is again that ring of dust and rock sort of around the Pluto zone, uh, if you will. Uh, those uh, short period comets um, tend to be about 30 to 55 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And then we have long period comets. They range from 200 years to thousands of years in their orbital period. Uh, and they originate from an area farther out in space called the Oort Cloud, which is a fun word to say, Oort. Uh, the Oort Cloud is much further away uh, than the Kuiper Belt and the planets. Uh, it's 5,000 to, oh, to 100,000 times uh, the Earth-Sun distance. So much, much farther out. In fact, this diagram is more of a two-scale diagram. Uh, there are billions of chunks of ice and debris out in the Oort cloud, uh, and they sort of surround the sun in this more of a bubble shape, whereas the Kuiper belt is more of a belt of objects, sort of a flat disk. Uh, so those long period comets are much more rare uh, and uh, very exciting when they happen to pass by. Um, there's a great example of a long period comet that passed by recently. Back in 2020, the comet Neowise, uh, which had an orbital period of 7,000 years, graced our night sky that summer. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and was, it was actually in celebration of the Neowise comet that we did this live stream uh, back three years ago. Now, comets have uh, been around uh, since the beginning of our solar system, um, but humans have only been uh, recording the history of our observations of comets uh, relatively recently, although it goes back pretty far in human history. And before we dive in, let me jump back over to the comments. We've got Elle watching, uh, who's watching from Malaitha and is so happy to be here. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Hope you enjoyed tonight's stream. We've got Eric tuning in from Lenexa. Thanks for watching, Dad. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Be sure to ask me any questions if you have them or just any comment. Comments? 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 Um, all right, let's jump into uh, our discussion of history. Oh, this is the diagram of Neowise, by the way. We can see its very uh, elliptical orbit. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, again, dive in a little bit more in depth later on that. Uh, oh, and this is a diagram of the observations of Neowise as it passed summer of 2020. Uh, quite uh, the <laughs> interesting... Uh, a path here that we that we observed in the night sky, uh, and again that's because of a comet's highly elliptical orbit, uh, sort of coming in from far out in the solar system and then zooming around the sun as it gets close to the Earth. So as I said, humans have been observing comets for a long time, almost as long as we've been recording history. Um, there are uh, some uh, rock sites that have been discovered in northern Italy that date back over 8,000 years. Um, and uh, so you can see this uh, rock site is about 6,000 years before the common era and these drawings depicted um, what historians are pretty sure uh, depict early observations of bright comets. There's some evidence that go back even further. Um, these uh, uh, etchings are from a Gobekli Tepe in southern Turkey and they date back 10 to 12,000 years in the past. Uh, pretty incredible stuff. Uh, these were believed to have commemorated a devastating event, and there's actually evidence of a comet striking the Earth approximately uh, 12,900 years ago. Um, so uh, perhaps this could have depicted that catastrophic event. There are computer simulations that align uh, with some of the art in the pillars uh, to constellations at the time. Uh, the stars have actually moved quite a bit uh, due to the Earth's um, axial tilt and its precession as the North Pole sort of moves around in the sky. Um, we've covered that in other live streams in the past and we cover it during our star tour as well. So some come by, stop by the planetarium and watch one of our live shows if you want to learn more about that. But essentially the stars have changed a lot over the past uh, thousands of years and so we using computer simulations we can kind of match where the stars were in the past to some of these uh, illustrations of constellations in these pillars. 
Um, this also aligns with Antarctic ice core findings. Again, that is how we uh, track different uh, large scale events like comet impacts. Um, so there is debris that has been detected in these uh, Antarctic ice cores that um, show evidence of this impact. And we've even actually uh, calculated evidence of changes to Earth's rotational axis as a result of a comet strike around this time. Pretty incredible stuff. Uh, Judy is in the comments as well, saying the Taylors and Carvers are watching. Thanks for watching tonight, Judy. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Hope you enjoyed the show tonight. And Laran's watching, hi, saying hi from Lenexa. Thanks for tuning in tonight, Mom. Hope you enjoy uh, my uh, rendition of the classic comet creation. Uh, and if I do anything wrong, be sure to let me know. Uh, my mother is the one who taught me how to make a comet uh, many years ago. So hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Um, so, going a little bit forwards in time, we come to Chinese astronomers, and I've covered it in the past, but um, Chinese astro astronomers were some of the first astronomers to uh, actually catalog and record different events, and so a lot of our um, historical records of events in the past, like comets uh, around this time period, come from Chinese astronomers. Uh, they documented comets dating all the way back to the 3rd century BCE. Uh, each of these comets was identified by a name, and it was accompanied with notes and other prognostications about the comet's significance. Again, uh, although they were recording the uh, comet's arrival, they still didn't fully understand the science of what was going on. But uh, they believed that these comets could have portended uh, important events in the world, like deaths of political leaders, uh, worldwide diseases, or even bountiful harvest, harvests. Kind of, they get a, kind of think of it as an early horoscope uh, based off of these comets. A Chinese astronomer named uh, Li Chengfeng actually discovered that a comet's tail points away from the sun over 900 years before Europeans discovered this, so they were starting to make some discoveries and inferences about the science of what was going on around comets. There was also the, the, the there was also the Bio tap Tapestry, which is a 231 foot long tapestry that depicted a comet in 1066, which was actually Halley's Comet, uh, which is one of the great comets um, that. Uh, has uh, uh, has been very famous, uh, one of the most famous and well-known comets. Um, we'll talk about Halley's Comet a little bit later, but uh, that is one that's almost a household name, known by name, uh, and uh, a very famous comet. We call we call comets that uh, pop up in depictions in art and uh, history great comets. Um, basically, there's no sort of scientific de definition of a great comet. It's usually just a very famous comet uh, that pops up in history or pop culture. Uh, but again, in 1066, this tapestry depicted Halley's Comet. There were even nativity uh, depictions. Uh, the idea that the Star of Bethlehem was a comet is actually one that dates back as far as 248 CE. Um, now, uh, we actually cover uh, the origins of the supposed Star of Bethlehem in our uh, Stars of Faith Planetarium show. So if you want to learn more about uh, whether or not the Star of Bethlehem could have been a comet, I'd encourage you to come see that show. Uh, but this uh, belief or theory coincided with the common pagan belief that uh, a comet often signified the birth of a king. Uh, Halley's Comet would have appeared around 12 BCE, and there was another bright comet that appeared uh, over Jerusalem in 66 CE, so perhaps these events inspired and shaped aspects of this legendary story uh, over millennia. Now, there are some other uh, depictions that we won't cover in depth um, of other comets, but we'll just kind of pass through some of these here. We've got one from uh, 1456. Uh, Napoleon's Death Mask actually uh, included a depiction of a comet there as well. Uh, and even some more uh, recent uh, art uh, depicts comets. So they pop up in art. They're very popular uh, subjects of art uh, as they were often associated with really important things that happened throughout history. Now, once we get into the modern study of astronomy and physics, um, we will come to Isaac Newton, one of the pioneers of our early understandings of physics. Uh, in 1687, Isaac Newton proved that an object moving under the influence of gravity must trace out an orbit shaped like a parabola, and he demonstrated this using the comet, uh, a comet in 1680 as an example by actually plotting its motion. Uh, so uh, essentially when we talk about comets having highly elliptical orbits, their orbits are long stretched out ovals, um, whereas planets' orbits are closer to circles, and Isaac Newton um, was the first one to kind of theorize these uh, orbital paths and their shapes, and he used a comet to demonstrate this. In 1705, uh, an astronomer named Edmund Halley um, 
applied a Newton's method of uh, calculating comets paths to 23 comets that were recorded between 1337 and 1698. Uh, Edmund Haley used Newton's equations to predict that three comets recorded in this period were actually the same comet reappearing. And he predicted that that comet would once again come back in 1759. This is the comet that eventually became known as Haley's Comet, and it is one of the most famous comets in history. It has a 76-year period, so relatively short. Um, short enough that for some people, it may actually come back twice within their memory. So it is a very famous comet uh, that pops up every once in a while. Um, the last appearance of Halley's Comet um, was a while back in 1986, so there may be some people watching who remember that. If you do remember that, if you're watching right now, uh, let me know what that experience was like. This picture is showing a photograph from the 80s of Halley's Comet. The next appearance, mark your calendars, will be in 2061, so let's uh, hope that all of us will be around to see that. Um, a French astronomer named uh, Del Ciel and his uh, young assistant Charles Messier observed the return of Halley's Comet, and this led to Messier's fascination with comets and other deep space objects. Uh, the Messier Collection of Objects is a collection of 110 uh, fascinating deep space objects uh, from um, nebulas to galaxies uh, that are uh, represent one of the most one of the earliest catalogs of deep space objects. We actually did an entire live stream about Messier objects a while back. So uh, you can check that out again on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. Now that we uh, have observed the history of our study of comets, well, what about the current study of comets? Well, as you may imagine, as we've started to explore our solar system with probes and rovers, we definitely have wanted to explore comets. So there are a number of uh, missions that have been sent to comets, and there's, uh, there are a number of modern observations of comets as well. Uh, this is uh, a picture showing an event that happened in 1992, um, uh, or well, 1994 rather, uh, and this is when the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 uh, actually collided with Jupiter. So uh, the comet started breaking apart in 1992, and in July 1994 uh, collided with Jupiter. We covered this in more depth uh, in uh, the Jupiter live stream. We did an entire show all about Jupiter. Uh, but from here on Earth, we actually could watch in real time as chunks of this broken up comet uh, actually crashed into Jupiter. And for months afterwards, we could see the scars of that impact um, on Jupiter's surface. By the way, this is a great example of why we uh, are very thankful to have Jupiter and the other massive gas giant outer planets. Uh, these planets are so massive, so much more massive than Earth, that their gravity uh, often pulls in objects that are passing through our solar system, objects like this comet. Uh, and thankfully, if those objects are on a collision course with anything, those planets, the major planets, Jupiter and Saturn, will grab those objects and protect the Earth. So that comet didn't crash into the Earth, uh, thanks uh, in part due to Jupiter's massive gravity. Uh, Elle is asking, or Ellie, I'm not sure I pronounced that, but uh, they're asking, how often can we see comets in our area? And that's a good question, um, and it really depends. Now, the thing about a comet, which we'll discuss when we start making one, uh, is that they're really hard to see. Uh, they're very dim, and they're not very uh, bright. Their albedo is very low. That's the science term for it. Um, and so we can't really see them when they're far away from the Earth. It's only when they get closer to us and their coma, their atmosphere, and their tail start to become more uh, visible that uh, we see them. So oftentimes when we hear about comets, it's months uh, ahead of their closest approach. Um, but generally every couple years, there will be a somewhat major comet that will be visible with the naked eye as long as you're far enough away from uh, light pollution. Um, so they're fairly rare, uh, but they're unpredictable, unfortunately, except for those uh, short period comets. Now, Eric is asking, if the tails of a comet are off-gassing and lose mass, do they gain mass when they're away from the sun? That's a great question, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the off-gassing of comets. Uh, but the general answer is no. Uh, comets um, and these uh, objects that originate from the Oort cloud um, are often kind of uh, kicked in uh, to the inner parts of the solar system due to collisions that are happening very far away in space. Uh, and that's how they kind of get their their uh, orbital uh, path as they kind of get close to the sun. Um, but in general, objects are so far spaced apart um, out in our solar system, especially far away in the Oort cloud, that um, these objects, uh, there's an infinitesimal chance that they would collide with anything else um, 
or absorb, absorb any significant amount of matter. So in general, comets are losing mass every time they kind of slingshot around the sun. And occasionally they'll just lose all of their mass or lose all of their gas and they'll sort of die. There are actually uh, many asteroids that we've detected that have been uh, shown to actually be sort of extinct comets or dead comets that have sort of ran out of gas and they're not really, um, they don't have tails anymore. So that's a really good question. So continuing on with the modern study of comets, the first mission we uh, kind of created to study a comet close up was the Stardust mission. This was launched in February 1999. And the primary mission of this probe was to collect dust samples from uh, a comet tail. Uh, and it used a brand new material that was invented called aerogel. Uh, and uh, aerogel is really cool. I used to have a sample uh, with me here, but uh, since I moved, I'm not sure where it is. Um, but aerogel is an incredibly uh, lightweight uh, synthetic material that's somewhat porous. It uh, has an extremely low density and low thermal conductivity. Um, it's sometimes nicknamed liquid smoke. Uh, it's very fragile, but uh, extremely light. It's one of the, the lightest um, solids that have ever been created. Um, and uh, the benefit of this material is that it's super light, so we can send it to space relatively cheaply without much, uh, much of a rocket needed, essentially. Um, but it's able to actually capture uh, dust from comet tails. So the Stardust mission actually flew through the tail of a comet, uh, and inside this aerogel, it was able to capture samples from that comet tail. The sample eventually returned in January 2006, and in those samples, we found a, a wide range of organic compounds, as well as evidence of liquid water. So we'll talk about the composition of comets coming up, but this was one of the first sort of real close-up discoveries of a comet. Uh, in August of 2014, scientists uh, dis announced that they had discovered interstellar gas inside these uh, uh, these samples. So these samples were actually continued to be studying years after the mission ended. Um, and uh, there is, uh, oh, and so uh, the most recent mission to a study a comet was the Rosetta mission. Uh, so here's a, a render of what that probe and lander looked like. Uh, so this mission, the Rosetta mission, was sent uh, it was launched in 2004 and reached its destination in 2014, and it was sent to study a comet named 67P Churyumov Gerasimenko. Uh, we'll call it 67P for short. Uh, but this probe orbited a comet uh, for a while, uh, taking um, uh, close-up pictures and readings from the comet, and it also sent a lander to attempt to land on the comet named Philae. Uh, now, there is some amazing science and photographs that were um, sent back from this mission. Here is a close-up photograph of Comet 67P. We can see its coma, the gas uh, creating its atmosphere here, and we can see its complex shape. Um, some people nicknamed this comet the Rubber Duck Comet because if you look at it uh, sort of sideways with one eye, you can sort of imagine a rubber duck shape. But um, there are some incredible photos. Um, taken of this comet. It was a relatively small comet. Here you can see it's a few miles across uh, relative to a city. Uh, this is not a real photograph. This is a uh, render in Photoshop. Um, but um, some pretty incredible stuff. Uh, now the Philae lander uh, wasn't exactly a success. It did reach the surface of the comet, but unfortunately the comet was rockier than they anticipated. And so uh, that close-up photo shows that it um, sort of tipped over. So we couldn't really use it to get any surface samples of the comet like we were planning. Um, but we got some pretty incredible science still. In fact, here is a video of the orbiter uh, orbiting the comet, which just seeing this every time really blows my mind because it uh, seems like an old-timey movie or something like that, but yeah, this, is, this is a video of a probe orbiting a comet. You can see the background stars moving as the comet is rotating and the probe is orbiting around it. Uh, and this may look like snow, but this is actually solar radiation that is uh, interacting with the sensors on uh, the orbiter. So uh, I mentioned it's sort of the rubber duck comet. I actually have uh, Space Engine here, our 3D planetarium software where we can uh, visit this comet. Um, so let's go over to 67P. Uh, we can see right now it's actually pretty far away uh, in its uh, orbital path. Um, we can zoom out here and see that it's been moving away from the sun um, pretty far out there, but uh, we can see that close up. You can kind of imagine a rubber duck shape there, right? <laughs> um, pretty cool stuff. 
Um, now, uh, back in 2020, the comet Neowise was uh, passing by, and that's why we did our first comet live stream. Uh, and it was discovered by the Neowise Space Telescope. I, I Just as a sort of a side note, a lot of modern comets sort of have boring names. Like Neowise's official name is C-2020 F3. Uh, the other comet we saw was 67P. Uh, this is mostly because comets now are uh, not often discovered by people, they're discovered by uh, scientific instruments or space telescopes. So this was Comet Neowise. It was visible in summer of 2020. Uh, its closest approach was actually July 22nd, my birthday. Um, so that was pretty cool. And this one was visible to the naked eye. So this was the last great comet that uh, was significantly visible here in North America. Uh, Jerry's asking, uh, comets rotate too, and they do indeed. Uh, comets, um, thanks to our, uh, our probes that orbit these comets, we found that their nuclei do indeed rotate. Um, and uh, yeah, just another interesting feature. Um, uh, that rotation um, is not enough to disintegrate the comets, obviously. The comets still staying close together, but uh, the comets do have their own rotational uh, inertia as well as their orbital path. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so there's background on comets, um, but what are comets actually made of? Well, that is our cue to transition to uh, our second camera setup, which is a special uh, treat for live stream. So stay tuned, everyone. We're gonna kind of change our scenery here. And we're going to jump over to uh, my kitchen. So we'll see you on the other side. All right, so let me pull up my comment section so I can still see everything. Maybe Ben can let me know if our stream still looks good. Uh, and welcome to our kitchen. Uh, and I'm gonna make a comment, but not alone. I do have help here. This is my fiance, Emily, who is gonna be helping me make a comment uh, and is definitely not gonna ask me any hard questions about comments also. Um, and Ben is giving me the thumbs up, still looks good. All right, so let's create our own comet. Now, our ingredients are here. These are all things you can get from a grocery store just to cover what our ingredients are. And we'll talk about what they represent in a minute, but we've got some vinegar, we've got some starch, I've got some syrup, and I've got some rubbing alcohol. We also have water and we have some soil. That's right, Dad, we're calling it soil today. And then we also have some dry ice in this cooler. Uh, dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide, and you may not know this, but you can buy it from grocery stores. Uh, so all this stuff you can get at the grocery store, and we are going to make our own comet. Uh, and this will be um, this will be a real comet in the sense that all the things that we're putting in in it are representative of what a comet would be. Um, but uh, you know, just be prepared to use your imagination a little bit uh, still. Now, um, I do want to make a brief note. We do recommend, if you're going to try this at home, that you uh, do have some safety protection. We are going to be using uh, gloves to handle the dry ice. Uh, and then we'd also recommend goggles for those uh, at home. Uh, we are professionals uh, who uh, definitely didn't misplace our goggles. So we are going to press onwards. I'm sure uh, everything will be fine. Famous last words. Uh, and then you'll want some towels, uh, and we're going to have a plastic bag and a, a mixing bowl here as well, and uh, some pillowcases that you don't, don't mind getting a little messy. Uh, and we do have some very appropriately spaced themed uh, heat protection gloves as well in these oven mitts. Uh, so step one, we are going to get some dry ice. Now I mentioned that comets originate from the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is uh, in the far reaches of our solar system, uh, and it is a big cloud of debris, mostly uh, frozen uh, carbon dioxide and water ice. So this ice is out in the far reaches of our solar system, and that is gonna be represented by the dry ice uh, or frozen carbon dioxide. Now what we're gonna do here is we are going to put some of that dry ice into our pillowcases. I've double lined these pillowcases. Uh, and we're gonna do this to crush up the dry ice. Um, so let's grab some dry ice. You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> you have, did you have any questions from the live? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you um, said this, I may have left it. Um, how fast 
is uh, the, how fast are the comments? Ooh, how fast do they go? That's a good question. Um, and that will depend on the comet's period or how wide its orbital path is. But when they're farther away from the sun, they're moving pretty slowly relative uh, to um, things in our solar system like uh, planets and, and planets like the Earth. But when they get close to the sun, they're moving a lot more quickly. And that is, again, due to physics and uh, discoveries made by Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, and uh, Kepler as well. Kepler's laws of motion dictate that the closer an object gets to the sun in its elliptical orbit, the faster it's moving. Exact speeds are all relative because space is moving. So I can't give you an exact answer. How's that for deflection? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great question. All right, so we are going to- um, Disturb our downstairs neighbors. Yes, how <laughs> that downstairs neighbors, but we're gonna break up our dry ice here. Um, without breaking our granite countertops. Oh no, if we do, we have to get new ones. That would be horrible, wouldn't it? Um, granite countertops are fine, but uh, granite tile countertops are a creative decision, we'll just call it that. All right, so don't, don't forget, if you are still watching, um, be sure to throw any questions or comments in the comment section. We do still have those over here. some slush here uh, and we're going to go ahead and um, put that in our large bowl uh, or no, actually no we're going to keep this separate for now we're going to mix the other things um, so I'm going to go ahead and keep this in our cooler keep it somewhat cold let's do this all right so we are going to mix our all of our other ingredients first uh, so Emily if you wouldn't mind giving me a liter of water that would be wonderful. So comets have a lot of water. Now, some scientists have theorized uh, that some of the water that exists on Earth came from comets. That would uh, be one of my questions. Could yeah. comets have brought life to Earth? Ooh, that's a great question. So could comets have brought water and life? I'll kind of expand that question, and we're going to answer that for sure. Uh, to start out with, let's talk about the water aspect of it, because for a while, we'll get to the yeah. light. Don't for a while, uh, astronomers did theorize that comets brought uh, water to Earth. Um, for a while, though, there were some uh, theories that sound, kind of contradicted that, and so scientists were kind of leaning away from that. But actually, in 2018, there was a close passage of a comet named 46P Wirtanen, and this comet, uh, 46P, was uh, studied and imaged by um, a telescope called SOFIA. This is actually a telescope uh, that's on board an airplane. Uh, it was decommissioned recently, but uh, this telescope uh, aboard a jumbo jet um, was uh, tasked with looking closely at this comet, 46P, as it passed by. Uh, and uh, it, um, as it was looking at the comet, it actually detected uh, similar ratios of deuterium and hydrogen as those found on Earth. So what had, what had happened was some comets we observed uh, observed water that had a little bit too much deuterium, which is a, a type of hydrogen molecule that is not common as common on Earth. So essentially, we found water on comets, but the water looked a little bit different. But then observing this comet in 2018, we found actually this comet had more similar uh, types of water. And so um, there's actually a study we can link to, but essentially this shows that actually there may be some comets that do have similar types of water to the water on Earth. So that kind of led credence to that theory that maybe there were some comet impacts in the formation of our solar system that did bring water to Earth. So we're gonna add this water to our comet crucible, we'll call it. There we go. Our comet cauldron, I like it. All right, now we're gonna be adding two cups of soil. Uh, we are gonna be using potting soil here. Emily, would you mind getting two cups of that for us, please? Is this two-ish cups? Two-ish cups, all right. Do we, can we, we want to it's demonstrate? two-ish. Yes. Soil, thank you. Would you like to add that? How exact does it need to be? Is it okay that it's not? Not exact. Space is crazy, you know? Space is crazy. <laughs> all right, so. Um, Dirt. This, uh, soil. Dirt. <clears throat> soil. Uh, this soil represents uh, dust, minerals, and water uh, there's water and soil as well, uh, found on comets. So comets aren't just ice. There is dust and other minerals um, that were around in, during the formation of our solar system. Very nice. Dirt day. Dirt day. That's right. Comet day. 
Uh, <laughs> now, a typical comet nucleus has a very low albedo, an albedo of 0 0.04, which is a very low number, trust me. Um, albedo is the shininess of an object in space. So the more albedo something has, the shinier it is, and the easier it is to see in space. Um, so comets are often blacker than coal uh, because they're covered in dust and debris as, rep as represented by our soil here. And that's why we don't typically detect them until they're a lot closer to the Earth. Uh, we, even, um, even then, we never really can see the surface of a comet unless we send a probe to it, like the Rosetta mission. What we're seeing when we see a comet um, through a telescope or even our naked eye is other parts of the comet, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, now we are going to be adding one tablespoon of starch. Would you mind adding that? Oh, we got some questions. Excellent. All right. Uh, Eric is, asked, is saying, I may have missed this, but why is the composition of comets and meteors so different? Aren't they pieces of celestial bodies that have broken up? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so now meteors uh, are uh, closer to the sun typically, uh, and they are less icy, but there is ice on meteors. Um, but essentially, they're closer to the sun, so there's more uh, heat from the sun that's able to keep them uh, warmer. And but whereas comets coming are coming from the Oort cloud, and that area of space is so far away that it's much more icy, and that ice hasn't sublimated or evaporated out from the space. That's, That's my question. question. Ooh, was, nice. um, what's the difference between a comet, an asteroid, and a meteor? Yeah, so a comet are typically icier, uh, and they have tails. And so we'll talk about the comet's tail in a minute. Um, and uh, asteroids, again, are rocky and more metallic, uh, and they're closer, uh, again, to the Earth. And the other one was? Meteor. Oh, meteor. Yeah, so a meteor is just any object. Uh, it's an object in space, an asteroid typically, that impacts the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so uh, as they are, uh, when they reach the Earth, we call them a meteorite. Um, but meteors, again, are objects in space that are on a trajectory to impact the atmosphere. So a comet is a meteor? Uh, comets... Okay, if it, could be, if it was like... That, that's a question I don't really answer to because, okay. um, well, luckily there haven't been any major comet impacts on the Earth recently. Um, but if a comet were to impact the Earth, um, something tells me that scientists would care less about whether or not to call it a meteor and care more about you sure. know, the general destruction. Are they are comets normally like humongous, or are they like? That's a good question. Are they like the size of our dry ice? I'm sorry. That's a great question. So we added some starch. Now comets don't have starch on them. Uh, this is representing gravity. So here on Earth, um, gravity is pulling us down. So we need something to represent gravity. Specifically, we need something to represent what holds comets together, because comets are not ice cubes, like solid chunks of ice. They're generally conglomerations of debris, but they're held together because of gravity. Um, now, starch is gonna kind of help our model kind of stay together, um, but comets of various size may have different amounts of gravity. The average diameter of a comet is uh, anywhere from, uh, or is anywhere from, let's see, about uh, 2,400 feet to about 12 miles. Oh. Um, so quite a wide range. So little. Just a relatively small. And now the, the, the comet or asteroid that uh, probably killed the dinosaur was about 10 miles away, to give you kind of some perspective. Um, most uh, meteorites or shooting stars that you, you would see are, are almost microscopic, like chunks of rock. And there are, there are somewhat spot larger pieces of rock that can explode in the atmosphere. They're called bolides. Um, but those are typically, you know, in a range of feet. Comets are much larger. Uh, but they are typically don't have Earth impacting trajectories, not going wood. Uh, a comet nuclei with uh, radiuses up to 19 miles of the surface. That's the biggest comet we've seen. But recently, evidence has found that uh, comets could possibly exist almost up to 200 miles wide. So that would be very bad from an expression in the Earth. Rusty in the comments is asking uh, Do the off gases or the tail come off a comet? At all the time, or just as it comes relatively close to the sun. Rusty, that is a fantastic question. Uh, and Dad coming in clutch. That's I right. <laughs> now, so typically, so again, that's an excellent question. And typically, they don't have comets when they're far away from the sun. It's only when they get close to the sun that that comet forms. And we'll talk about where that comet comes from in a minute when we can actually see the tail for ourselves. Um, but the tail will go away if that comet survives its trip around the sun and kind of moves back out into the far reaches of our solar system. So tails are temporary for comets. Uh, like lizards. My father is is uh, in the comets 
asking you please to call it soil. <laughs> we'll see about that, Eric. <laughs> All right, so we've added starch representing gravity. Now we're gonna add some syrup. Would you mind adding one tablespoon of syrup, please? The syrup in our model is gonna represent organic compounds. These organic compounds give off a dark appearance. Uh, yep, one tablespoon. Um, and this dark appearance is uh, one thing that causes, can I keep it exact? <laughs> one thing that causes uh, their dark appearance, like I said, and why, why it's hard to see comets from uh, far away from the earth. Um, so uh, organic compounds, organic makes you think of life, right? So to bring it back to the discussion of life, uh, on July 30th, 2015, scientists reported that the Philae spacecraft, the lander that came on the Rosetta mission, um, that landed on Comet 67P, uh, detected at least 16 different organic compounds, of which four of them were detected for the first time on a comet, and these included uh, uh, acetamide, acetone, methyl, isocyanate, and propionaldehyde. <laughs> I'm an astronomer and not an organic chemist, but hopefully I did those okay. Um, so again, some organic compounds have been discovered uh, on comets. Now, organic compounds doesn't mean life, um, but those are compounds that are often found uh, in life. And there, that's not all, because the next thing we're going to add is one tablespoon of vinegar. So this vinegar is going to represent amino acids. Uh, yeah, we probably want to stir it up, David. Uh, let's... Uh, it's a bit goopy. Let's pick one that we don't mind getting goopy. Maybe a plus. Why don't, you get, why don't you give that a stirring? Please. Can you drink? Uh, I'm good, thanks. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the vinegar represents amino acids. Uh, the amino acid uh, glycine, along with some of its precursor organic molecules and the essential element phosphorus, were spotted in the cloud of gas and dust surrounding the comet 67P by the Rosetta spacecraft. Now, glycine had previously been extracted from com cometary dust from the Stardust mission, Comet Soup. Um, this was the first time that the compound had, had been detected in space, naturally vaporized. Uh, the discovery of those building blocks around comets support the idea that comets could have played an essential role in the development of life on early Earth. Mm. Amino acids form the basis of proteins, which are uh, complexly folded molecules that are critical to life on Earth. And the research team studying these molecules and samples searched for other amino acids around the comet, but only located glycine. It was, uh, glycine is the only uh, organic compound uh, that... Uh, formed without liquid water, as uh, in the frig frigid reaches of space, there's not a lot of liquid water, because it's very cold. Um, now, this glycine probably didn't form on the comet itself, researchers said, but rather in the broad stretches of dust and debris that make up the solar system, that made up the solar system uh, before its formation. So these things have been around in the solar system for a long time since its formation. They eventually conglomerated into a comet, and again, because we've detected them on comets, and we know that in the early days of the solar system, there were a lot of impacts that created the debris that eventually formed the Earth. Perhaps these organic compounds and amino acids came from comets. The last thing we're going to add is a little bit less than one tablespoon of rubbing alcohol. Um, now, in the, sa in the same research that detected uh, the water on the comet 46P, astronomers detected an unusual amount of uh, methanol, acetylene, ethane, ammonia, and hydrogen cyanide. Oh my goodness. Ooh, it's swirling around. That's cool. Stuff's happening. Yeah, so this discovery changed the way that scientists understand how carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen molecules were distributed in the early system, or so in the early solar system where the comet formed. So a lot of crazy stuff is going into comets, and we are mixing that all together, and we are going to be stirring in the dry ice here. And now I want you to observe as you're doing that. Um, there is going to be some steam formed, or what will look like steam. Um, what this is actually, uh, what, what you'll be seeing here, the white cloud that's going to come off from this, is moisture in the air that's being frozen by gases coming out of the dry ice. So let's go ahead and lock that in. All right, I'm trying not to burn myself here. Fix this. Let's see. All right, maybe 
is not going to like this. There we go. Ooh. Oh. Ho, ho. I hope people can can people hear the oh wish you could hear it. Yeah, let us know in the comments if you can hear the bubbling and gurgling. So stir that up a little bit. Oh, oh it's that's fine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. So once the dry ice is in the bowl, we're gonna be picking up the sides of our trash bag here, and I'm gonna switch to these <laughs> mitts. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be kind of squishing it into a ball. Oh, those are going to get so dirty. <laughs> oh, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely still a lot of liquid in here, but I'm going to try to squeeze it into a ball here. Oh, we've got, it's, um. Oh. <laughs> We've got some leakage uh -oh. going on. Right. Oh. That was the best of us. <laughs> That's all right. This is actually part of the science because not all comets stay in one piece. Comets often break apart, as we observed with the comet uh, Schumacher Levy 9 that impacted Jupiter. This is totally on purpose. That's it, yeah. It's all, all part of the scientific all demonstration. Part of the plan. It's fine. All part. I can't wait to do laundry later. All right. Ooh. So trying to clump it together. Oops. Doing great. I think I'm doing all right. Okay, so um, I mean, I think it's a pretty obvious after some of what you've already said. How this comet that we are making mm. is different than a comet that is actually found yes. in space. Obviously, there's no maple syrup in a comet in space, but... Very water. Mm -hmm. Other than that, like, is that, uh... <laughs> how, how is this one? How accurate is it? Yeah. Uh, it's pretty accurate. Again, the, uh... You know, there are definitely more organic compounds in maple syrup than there are in comets, but the idea is still there. I think we're going to need to add more dry ice, because we're still very liquidy. But, uh... The amount of dry ice you want to use is Subjective. not exact. <laughs> Science. Science rules. I think Bill Maya would be. All right, got some more of this. Shout outs to my lovely fiance being okay with us destroying our kitchen for for science. I will not be cooking dinner tonight. That is fair. All right. Ooh, that's a lot of dry ice. Yeah, that was a lot. That's all right. Ooh, ah, it's nice and chunky. Feeling good. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh! We have a comet! I'm gonna switch. So oh, can you touch that? No, not a comet. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's still dry, so you'll still want to use some sort of heat protection. But this, oh, this is a beautiful comet. Look at this. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Here's our comet. Yeah. All right, so this is what we call the nucleus of the comet. Oh, listen to that. It's talking to us. Scientists often refer to this as a dirty snowball, and you can see why. So again, there is a close-up of the comet. Emily, would you feel comfortable holding the comet up in front of the camera while I talk about it? Uh, yeah! All right. It's very noisy. It is very noisy. Me too. Yeah, watch out the one of the fingers is kind of 
from that one. I uh, Calvin in the comments saying, I know that this question has probably been asked, but here we go. Uh, why does the comet turn green? Ah, and we are going to cover that in just a minute, actually. It turns green? Yeah, so, all right, so would you mind holding that up to the camera so everybody can get a closer look? Well, that's uh, kind of right. hard. Right up to, uh, yeah, that's fine. All right, so, again, this is the nucleus of a comet. Vanna White. Um, results of the Rosetta and Philae spacecraft show that the nucleus of comet 67P has no magnetic field, which suggests that magnetism may not have played a role in the early formation of these comets. Just a little sidebar, comets are not magnetic. Now, as comets get closer to the sun, they heat up, which forms an atmosphere called a coma. And so we're going to provide our comet some heat. I didn't test that. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I'm going to come around this side. All right. There we go. So it's, the comet keeps up a, a uh, gas, <laughs> gas uh, starts to sublimate, uh, or the solids on the comet, like the frozen carbon dioxide, start to sublimate, turning from a solid to a gas. And this creates uh, the atmosphere of the comet called a coma. Oh, no. um, the coma of a comet can often become larger than small planets are stuck to the comet. A little bit. That's okay. Um, so comets can be huge, and that coma is what we actually observe when we see a comet with the naked eye. We see a fuzzy glow, and that's the atmosphere of the comet. We can usually see jets coming out of the comet as well, uh, as heat causes it to evaporate, and there are actually jets coming out of different parts of the comet. The image we saw uh, for in the uh, 67P uh, um, images from the Rosetta mission, uh, you can actually see some of these jets coming off of certain areas. This is a really nice, accurate example from this comet here. Uh, and when comets pass close to the sun, uh, they do sometimes totally evaporate, and we don't even see them as they come around the other side. So you never quite know, as a comet gets close to the sun, how much of a tail it's going to have, uh, and um, if it's going to fall apart or not. Uh, now, there are a couple of forces that act on the comet that cause its tail. Uh, first of all, there is the sun. So here's the sun. <laughs> <It's flashlight. laughs> but yeah, we're going to just throw in something, something to demonstrate. So here's the sun. So, ooh, okay. So imagine the sun. Uh, or Well, the actual sun is also shining on the comet right now. So we'll just, we'll just say that's the sun. Now, <laughs> the sun uh, is giving off heat and solar wind. Uh, and that um, is going to create the comet's tail. So pressure from the sunlight and high-speed solar particles, solar wind, blows the coma, its atmosphere, away from the sun, forming a long tail stretching hundreds of millions of miles behind the nucleus of the comet. Now, comets often have two tails. Uh, there are dust tails and gas tails. So as the comet is disintegrating, there will be chunks of dust and debris coming off of the comet. And what's going on in here? You can, do you want to you get another comet? Why don't you, why don't you pull on another uh, example of a comet there? This, there's a tiny comet. It's a little comet. Comet test. Oh. So again, there are two different types of tails. Um, the, uh, the dust tail is often, um, it, it often arcs away from the comet's path, and so the dust tail will be curved as it's going around the sun. And it's formed when solar wind pushes small particles in the coma into that, uh, that tail, and it, those tails are often um, sort of dimmer and uh, less colorful. But then there's a gas tail, uh, and this, uh, this gas tail often glows in various colors, like blue or green. So that's that green tail that you'll see. Ooh, that's a really nice chunk. Yeah. Let's take a look at that. Okay. That's Sorry. nice. <laughs> uh, so the ion tail is formed when electrically charged molecules uh, is formed from electrically charged molecules of gas. And the ion tail always points in a straight line away from the sun. So there are two tails. Sometimes they can be close together, but sometimes they'll split. So you'll see pictures of comets with one straight, colorful tail coming up. That's the ion tail. And one sort of curved, uh, wider, dusty tail. Uh, and so, yeah, we can... <laughs> we can uh... There we go. So here we're creating a tail from the comet. Although it's kind of evaporating quickly. Maybe turning the... 
just there we go. Your your breath is much better uh, <laughs> ionizing. Or, uh, I, I did just eat some onions, radiation. so that's probably that's what, what it is. is. Yeah. So again, there are two major types of tails. We can't really see the ionizing tail with the naked eye. So oftentimes, those pictures of uh, colorful comet tails are through uh, different types of uh, imaging telescopes that can. Um, take in light for much longer periods of time. So when you look at a comet, a great comet that's visible to the naked eye, you'll often just see one uh, bright tail. Um, now, comet tails get longer as the comet approaches the sun, and they can end up millions of miles long, as I mentioned. Uh, and um, yeah, and, but often most comets are too small and faint to be seen with the naked eye. Um, so you will need a telescope or, um, you know, uh, depending on light conditions and light pollution, they may be really hard to see. Uh, so, Calvin, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, the different colors of the tails, by the way, are different elements that are ionizing. Um, and that uh, gets into a whole different topic about um, uh, spectroscopy. But essentially, it was kind of squealing. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> In space, there's no sound. But here on Earth, <laughs> our comet is, is yelling at us. Um, so essentially different elements uh, that are being ionized will glow in different colors, long story short. Now comets can sometimes run out of gas, so to speak. In fact, astronomers estimate roughly 6% of near-Earth asteroids are thought to be extinct nuclei of comets that are no longer experiencing outgassing. Now comets leave a trail of debris behind them that can lead to meteor showers here on Earth. In fact, the famous Perseid meteor shower, which occurs every August, it just happened recently actually, uh, it happens when the Earth passes through the orbital path of the comet Swift Tuttle. So the Perseid meteor shower, uh, actually, there we go. Then come back to your question earlier. Meteor showers can be caused by debris from comets. So in a way, meteors are just any uh, either a comet or a an asteroid or particles from those objects that are passing through the Earth's atmosphere. So there's our comet. You want to show that off to the camera again? My hands are very cold. Enjoying great. There's hair in it. That's fun. Ooh. Organic compounds. There you go. Here's the butt. Don't get, don't get rid of it too soon. We'll need to do a uh, we'll do a posed uh, thumbnail shot here in a minute, or we can do it right now on camera. Here, let's here, let's sneak over here. We're doing this live. Here, come over here. I was freeze framed. We're gonna get. Well, that might be too close. It's Same. gonna be very close. Okay, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> mm. It's fine. We're doing this live. Here, let's let's like lean over here. Okay, everybody, you're wit you're witnessing. Don't bump into it. Ah! You're witnessing a, a thumbnail here. Oh, it's cracking. Uh oh. Okay, look, you gotta look. You gotta make be making an oh ah face. That's what YouTube likes. <laughs> okay, sorry, everybody. There we go. <laughs> Yikes. Usually, I do that off you. So there's our comment. What's our comment? So, like, is the, oh, this is comet. frozen. Yeah, we're kind of calling this comet Emily Patrick. Great. It's a bad name. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start wrapping up our stream today, folks. Um, if you have any last minute questions or comments, put those in now because we are going to be ending soon. Um, just real quick, though, if you are wondering what the next comet possibly visible to the naked eye is, well, it may actually be visible now ish. There's a comet uh, named C 2023 P1 or a Nishimura that is actually a reaching its closest approach. Um, now, it is a fairly dim comet, um, but it is uh, visible in the Northern Hemisphere. It has a period of 400 years, uh, and the comet uh, should be observable through binoculars right now. Um, but around this weekend, it may be visible to the naked eye. Um, as far as where it can be seen, uh, that's something that I should have double checked how do they know uh, how smart the comet cool. is? You said that it was dim. Ah, that's a good one. All right, so the comet uh, Nishimura is going to be near the or near the constellation Leo, uh, which means it's going to be right around sunset because Leo is setting in the early evening towards the west. So this one's going to be really hard to spot. In fact, I'm going to say there's probably a very small chance you'd be able to see it, but if you're very far away from the city lights. You may check that out near the constellation Leo. And there's potential for another great comet, which again is just a very famous comet visible brightly to the naked eye, um, that is going to be coming around next year. It's uh, called Comet uh, Suchenchen-Atlas, or uh, C2023A3, 
Really need to work out the common names here, but okay, that's all right. I'm just going to be my other question. <laughs> yeah. Why are astronomers so bad at naming things? So have well, they heard of, like, happened. words? Some, just... some of them haven't. <laughs> I know, we need to work on that. But, uh, but anyway, so this comet uh, is going to be coming around uh, in October of next year. Um, it's far enough away, though, that we've only detected uh, it very dimly, so it doesn't have any tail or anything yet. But, uh, but around next summer, as it approaches the sun, its tail will start to form, and we'll get a better idea of, is it big enough, and does it have the right composition to have a really bright tail? But around October next year, we may have another really bright comet, so be sure to keep a lookout for that. October of next year. Yep. Mark your calendars, folks. That's right. You're only 14 months away. Maybe we'll, we'd be able to see it on our honeymoon. Although that, that, would that be a really good omen or a bad omen? Who knows? Who's to say? <laughs> it's like we'll rain on out. your wedding day. That's right. It's like comets on your wedding day. All right, guys. Well, we're going to start wrapping it up here. In the comments, we've got a bunch of people chiming in. Uh, my dad, Eric, is saying you guys make a great team. I think so, too. Wouldn't you say? Uh, Tana Me is saying, Emily seems fun. She's a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, Emily and Patrick. Congratulations again to you both. This is a great live stream episode. Tammy, thanks so much. Thanks for watching. Uh, and stay tuned. I hope that you'll be able to join us for our in-person live stream sometime early next year. We're going to try to organize something in the planetarium. Who knows what will happen? It might be crazy. It might be a total disaster, but we're going to make it happen. Uh, Lisa is saying thank you so much. Uh, and I'm saying thank you so much as well. I am going to have to very unsmoothly transition to my other station so I can end the live stream, though. So Emily will vamp here while I head oh. out into the um, distance. All right, say goodbye, Emily. Goodbye. Goodbye, Emily. There we go. All right, everyone. Well, thank you again so much. I have been your planetarium manager, Patrick Hess. She has been my fiance, Emily. And, oh, she still is, hopefully. And uh, we had a great time tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next month. I'm not sure when it'll be, maybe later in the month, just to space things out a little bit. But we are going to be doing our next deep dive into uh, science fiction. Oh, and our final cameo of the night, we have our mascot, Phoebe. Is it a live stream without Phoebe? It is not. Hi, Phoebe. Scratch. That's right. Can you give me kisses? Scratch. Or scratch. She give me scratch. Give me scratch. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh. Phoebe, what are you doing? Scratch. What are you doing? All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks again, everyone. What a great way to end the stream. And on that note, we will see you next time, everybody. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Scratch. Bye, everybody.